Every year, approximately 500 tonnes of power are taken illegally from New Zealand's coasts, with a black market value of around $36 million. Widespread poaching is putting the species under threat, so the Ministry of Fisheries has been waging a war against the poachers. Operation after operation has netted huge hauls of illegal power, but MFish knows this is just the tip of the iceberg. Up on the hill, Henry has the suspects in view. They've been busted twice before for taking excess in undersized seafood that often ends up on Auckland's black market. I don't know why they don't learn, but they seem to keep plundering the same area, and I guess the same area can only handle so much plundering, so we've got to do something about it. Over the next hour, the suspected poachers fill their boat with crayfish, then set two fishing nets out on the reef. They just shot another net in that uh, reef there just behind them. Unaware they're being watched, the group's MO becomes apparent. They hide their catch out of sight in a holding pot around the island. Henry reports into the intercept team. Oh, I can hear it, so it's not too far away. Who swing into action. And with that, the group are stopped in their tracks. I'm Marcy from the Ministry of Fisheries. Can you say my warrant, OK? You guys been fishing today? No, we just went to pick up our net and some kinna. Pick up your net and some kinna. Everybody appears friendly and acting like nothing is wrong. But the back of the boat is a mess of nets, bins, fish and shellfish. And working out the extent of the offending is going to take some time. But a large quantity of kinna. He's the only diver. So he's only allowed 50 kinna. It's probably an excess of 300 kinna there. He's got uh, a couple of dozen power, all of which are under size. Everybody is visibly shocked at the extent of the offending, except for the men themselves, who appear oblivious to what their fishing methods could be doing to marine life in the area. The net's been set on the reef, um, and all the fish that's been caught in it. The crayfish come out to feed on the fish that are stuck in the net, so it's effectively, well, I guess, a baited net. They've already got their quota, so these ones stuck in the net are sort of above their 12. So I'll just try and pull them out and measure them and count them and try and get them back in the sea. That's a female cray. Should be 60 millimetres and barely 50. You, you just need to look at how much there is here, eh? Excess power, excess crayfish, illegal nets. It just goes on and on. I mean, this is a swag of fish. As the body count of fish keeps rising, officers are attempting to get an accurate statement from those involved. However, the stories are just not adding up. The answers keep changing on me. Why is that? Did they pull a pot? Yeah, he said they pulled it. Yeah, he's saying he died. But they've got no permit. No. But there is little anybody could say to justify this sort of fishing. So the rock lobster and the kinna we're going to return to the sea because it's still alive. And it's all been photographed and exhibited. And the rest of the stuff will be frozen down. And then once the court case is finished, it'll be disposed of. With some of the catch heading back to the sea, everybody else heads for the offender's house, where even more fish are found. Uh, we just emptied the contents of two freezers. Um, half the stuff's not even frozen probably because it's just all been dumped in there in mess. And it's half rotten, it's really hung in about now. So we're just going to put it all in bags and probably put it back in the freezer. And he wants to clean it first. All up, well over 100 fish are found in two freezers. And along with the excess fish, crays, power and kinna found earlier, it raises questions if they were destined to be sold illegally. While the offenders' denials continue, Marcy and the rest of the team have enough evidence to confiscate their boat, car and fishing equipment. Very happy, very happy. Um, it's been a lot of hours going to this week. Um, the um, boys have, have done some hard work there, um, but we've come up with a uh, good result. Dive on them because they The main offender was charged with taking fish in contravention of the Fisheries Act and received 300 hours community service and was banned from fishing for three years. His vessel and vehicle were forfeited to the Crown. We're just about arriving at the position that I'm going to take up, um, just back from where they'll be diving. Brenda and seven officers in unmarked cars take up hidden positions circling the target area, while Dan heads to a vantage point on the cliff overlooking the bay. Well, as long as I've known, there's been quite a big problem with power poaching in the area. These guys are one of the main players, uh, 
but then luck will get him today. It isn't long before Dan spots the suspects. Hey, that's our guys. Keep down, you guys. That's our guys. That's our meat. That's our boys. We have four guys. Look like they're ready to dive. I think one of them's our red-headed guy. They've got bags and dive gear. Are you in a position to be able to see anything that goes into the rear of either of those two vehicles? Roger that. As these poachers are prepared to operate in broad daylight, they may well be aware that they're being watched. Power stocks in these waters have been severely depleted by organised gangs taking undersized fish. You guarantee most of them would be, well, 99% of them will be undersized. So. The lost revenue um, for New Zealand economy per year is millions of dollars. And it's for that reason that we want to close them down. It'll get to the stage where anyone going down to fish won't be able to even go in and find one power for a feed for their family. Months of work could be lost if the suspects spot any of the hidden fishery officers. We must be careful not to blow our cover, guys. Over. Okay. Stay low, boys. Stay low, boys. <laughs> Their vigilance pays off as sacks of power start emerging from the sea. Yeah, we've got one white bag coming out of the water. Go. Yeah, the, one of the other divers has just come in with a sack and they've had a hole pre-dug on the beach. They've buried it in the sand. Over. Roger that, just maintain ops on the sack, mate. Yeah, we've still got two divers in the water. Keep your eye on that sack, mate. We have another sack coming up onto the beach. It's been buried, over. So that's four sacks. Uh, that's three, and we have another guy with long hair. Just pulling another sack out of the water. Jesus. And he's running up onto the beach. See him sticking seaweed in that on top? We have three sacks buried on the beach. And the cheeky these fellows, mate. They're cheeky. Now they wait. With important evidence disappearing into the suspect's cars, Brenda calls the police. Uh, can you confirm whether any went into the green flash car? Uh, yeah, that's going into the green car now. Over. He's closed the door. I think they'll be a quick go out of here. Do you be in a position to get the red Joe, do you reckon, Dan, or not? Negative. OK, the green vehicle is leaving. Over. Heading out towards the airport, over. The police are on their way, but the poachers may still try to outsmart the authorities. There's another thing these guys do. They do their dive, and then they'll go for a, a dive and get some kinners. And when we stop them, they usually got a boot full of kinners, and they, they can verify that they've been diving and all that sort of thing. It's a lot of little devious little tricks they haven't come up with <laughs> through the years. The police stop the first car a short way down the road. The police have apprehended the driver, and he's gone in for questioning. Roger. Yeah, we've got one. Lafifi got the old man in that car. I've taken them to the cop shop. Look out, coming up again. Just come out of the water with another brown sack and buried it on the beach. And there's three sacks still buried on the beach. Uh, the targets uh, look like they're about to move out. OK, this is a um, call to all the cars. We're moving now. We're moving now. Copy that. We're on our way, over. Go, go, go. Mfish okay. mobilise all their hidden personnel and spring the trap. I think we're going to have to go down, mate. Right here. The suspects don't react well to being caught red-handed. Put your camera away, you might fall over. Single Single yes. The evidence against the poachers quickly mounts as more and more illegal power are pulled from their hiding places on the beach. Ooh, that's a big one. Oh, Rocky. Who's all this stuff in here? This stuff. That's your shopping? Yeah, but I found this from, uh, from them. Inside no. the, the sack. It was inside was, the sack. Who put it in the, the car? You I stole it from the sack. You stole it from your. You stole it from your bros. <laughs> this woman seems to have poached from the poachers. <laughs> Were you diving today or not? Yeah, I was diving today. Did you get some of these poles? What sack do you want me to point out? Point out your one, mate. Adding these sacks to the shellfish found in the cars means the poachers have collected almost a thousand power, up to fifteen thousand dollars worth on the black market. So with any luck, we can, we can get back, we can process the power, and with any luck, get it returned to the sea. 24 M fish officers from Northland, Auckland and Tauranga have joined forces to bust a black market fishing operation in the Bay of Islands. The suspects have been under surveillance for five weeks, and now it's time to move in. M fish know the exchange of fish takes place in Ruakaka, south of Whangarei, so they'll shadow the man they've dubbed Rock Lobster to the rendezvous. True to form, the black marketeer is taking the same route as previous weeks. 
Mfish now know that both Charlie and Rock Lobster have arrived at the pickup point. A static surveillance team is watching the exchange itself, but from their previous week's observations, they know what Charlie's MO will be. He will uh, look at the house, he'll drive past it and come back around and he'll muck around up uh, around near the house for a little while and then he will back into uh, the rendezvous house. He'll back straight up to the truck and they will exchange the products. The comms are momentarily down when a white van goes tearing past. It looks, that looks like our man, it's one up and it looks like it, over. Yeah, well, we're on the road now too then. Uh, we're heading from north, is that the van? Yeah, affirmative. He is, uh, he's just gone past the Waipu golf course. This shows you how, uh, how easy they can slip through. A lot of white vans on the road. All units are on high alert, and for the moment, Charlie is lost from view. He's out now, and he's uh, filling up his truck. Time is 16.08. Uh, Rob Lobs says called into the Gold Station. Uh, I'm going to do a, a bit of a, a loop around it and go back uh, south and then come back through uh, behind it. But disaster strikes. Ricky loses sight of Rock Lobster and then catches a red light. We'll get up there as quick as possible. OK, matey. Shoot, shoot. Uh, the other guys have, have been caught at the lights. Um, so at this time, we, we've uh, lost uh, um, Rock Lobster. Get a little bit closer and see if I can confirm the red light. Let's make sure. Yeah, yeah, I'll race up and have a look. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Hey Baz, if you get an eyeball on him, let, him know, let us know, will you? Because I'm, uh, I'm just trying to catch up to this uh, other white van who could be our man, over. It's their man, all right. They're back on track. No such luck for Ricky, who's on the phone to headquarters in Whangarei for instructions. He decides to double back. OK, I'm going to head back into town, uh, townways, see if he uh, has pulled off. Um, at Burger King or something like that. And then a stroke of good fortune. My bet is this, this is Rock Lobster here. Um, here he comes now. OK, I'll make the right hand turn. One person on board. You beauty. The police are going to stop the truck at a pre-arranged point and a police car pulls out to join the convoy. OK, the uh, police are about to pull over Rock Lobster now. 1657, uh, Rock Lobster has uh, been pulled over by uh, the police. Fishery officers have to be present at the arrest and Ricky's made it just in time. Richard Radapu, fishery officer. Okay. It doesn't look good for the suspect who has a wad of cash in his back pocket. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Counted $900. Uh, it's good that we found cash on them. That's really good. Shows that uh, a, a transaction may have taken place. When people deal in illegal fish, they're dealing in cash. So, and there's an interesting find in the cab of the truck. So what we've got here is a diary. It's a record of people that he's been uh, uh, talking with. The truck is seized and the police take the suspect back to Whangarei for questioning. Gary Mackinnon is still on the road, tailing Charlie back into Auckland. A two of many, three of many. He's just going hard. He's going hard on the Hamilton Manukau road. So that's good. Because this guy's quite erratic, so trying to follow him through the traffic, if he gets a break and you don't, you're wedged in, you're boxed in. They finally make it to South Auckland, where the man's fish shop is situated. It's the moment Gary's been waiting for. Gary wants to catch the man red-handed, so he heads round to the rear of the shop where Charlie's unloading the fish. Time to move in. Hello. Hello, yeah. Hello. Are you, what's your name? Yeah. Your name, sir? Kim. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah? Actually, yeah, yeah Kim. The yeah, I'm a fisheries officer. Gary McInerney is my name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? How are you? Yeah. You're yeah. the owner and the manager of this business, are you? Yeah. There's a huge amount of work to be done to process the evidence at the fish shop, but Gary is hampered by the language barrier, and he can't begin the process until a Bill of Rights caution can be read to the suspect. The arrival of an interpreter means that MFish can now search the premises, and the suspect can take a trip to the police station. The team now face the huge task of collecting evidence, as well as counting all fish on the premises. Another half bin of blue mochi. 
five kilos snapping in. In all, the three men faced 18 serious charges laid under the Fisheries Act. They were convicted and fined a total of over $53,000, and vehicles and fishing vessels worth $96,000 were forfeited to the Crown. There's a high level of organised poaching in this area, and as on previous operations, there are several divers in the water. There are numerous forest trails leading from the beach, so to cover the exits, the Northland officers split into teams. Ricky heads to a vantage point high above the beach, while West needs to conceal any evidence of M. Fisher's presence before moving into position. Can you see it? <laughs> I hope they didn't see us coming in. At the other end of the beach, Ricky's first target is making a move. They're on the grass now and um, heading up one of the tracks. And we'll give you a toes up to which way they're going. West hopes to head off the suspects at a junction in the forest. But Phil and Doug beat him to it. Two, 84, 86, 88, 89. 89 power. The two men have collected 200 power, 10 times the daily limit per person, and almost all are under size. Mfish estimate as little as 1% of the power leaving Kawarua is the legal 125 millimetres. Maximum fine of um, $100,000 and forfeiture of of all the gear that they've used in the commission of the offence. Ricky has more suspects in his sights and sends through an alert. In 40 minutes, they could harvest easily up to 200 power. Harvey sees more than he expects. Yeah, the first diver out um, is now dressed. He's got a black singlet, uh, blue jeans by the looks of it, uh, no underpants on. He's got some down the front of his shirt too, I have. Yeah, mate, that's a killer too. For their sakes, I hope they've got a permit. Yeah, on the roll now. Ricky's patience is rewarded as the suspect vehicle finally heads off the beach and into the arms of M Fish. West and the others have blocked their escape route with their quad bikes. What we've got is uh, three guys with 60-odd, um, 70-odd power here. My bet is that they're all undersized. We've got an undersized crate and um, excess power. You guys got a permit? No, nah, no. They're all under size, so right. um, what's your explanation for that? Have you got any explanation? Uh, yeah, just didn't know the size, boss. Yep. Measuring is painstaking and accurate. Hefty infringement fines and confiscated property can hinge on dimensions and quantities. Because they've got more than three times the daily limit, one of the gentlemen there's got 59 power, and uh, because he's in position of it with a vehicle, the vehicle um, then becomes forfeit to the to the Crown. The operation at Kawarua resulted in two people being charged with serious fishery offences, the seizure of two vehicles and 11 infringement notices issued for the taking and possessing of excess and undersized power and crayfish. Of the 480 power measured by Mfish, only 18 were of legal size. Gisborne is one of many areas where fish stocks are under threat, and today these fisheries officers are tackling the problem of overfishing through a checkpoint on the road from Wainui Beach. But this station wagon is about to prove an eye-opener for even the most experienced officers. A search of the boot reveals two large sacks of cannabis. I'll get on the phone now. Yeah, hi, look, it's Brian Danner from Minister of Fisheries here. We've got a vehicle stop. We are at Wainui Beach, just north of Gisborne. We've stopped the car and it's uh, got two large bags of cannabis in the back, two large rubber sacks full of cannabis. Can we have uh, some police assistance there as soon as possible? Just quickly, um, obviously we're with Minister of Fisheries. Brad explains to the couple he's called for police assistance and they're on their way. OK. And what about my kids? They were standing okay. at their school. OK, OK. Just We're acting under the directions of the police. The police have instructed us. How long have you guys been here for? Uh, a little while, but that's OK. The police are on their way now. OK? So do you understand that? Do you understand? Excellent. Look at all this uh, What we've just had happen here is uh, something that does happen from time to time, uh, fisheries checkpoint. I've uh, spoken to uh, police, immediately got on the phone to police communications, advised them of the situation and asked for some uh, backup. The police are at the scene within minutes and a further search of the vehicle reveals another bag of cannabis. And while the guy openly admits to owning the drugs, he seems less sure about the car. Look at that pink. Good stuff, eh? Is this your car? 
Hey? Is this your car? Where is she living? Whose car? Whose car is it? Oh, it's not under any of us. Well, whose car is it? It's not what I asked. Chess. Oh, it's not. We haven't changed the ownership okay. since Whose car it. is it? You bought it? Is no, it I didn't buy it. My sister Her bought it. My sister bought it for us. How much you had to drink? You weren't driving me? <laughs> no. No, I wasn't. <laughs> this is clearly not his first beer today, which is perhaps why he seems to think there's a chance of saving his crop. The cannabis will be incinerated, but today's unusual catch has been a memorable find for Brad and the other fisheries officers. It's, a, it's not power, but it's the uh, next best thing. The guy pleaded guilty to charges of cultivating and possession of cannabis and was ordered to do 75 hours community service and the woman received a warning.